So, uh, good evening. Thank you all for coming out tonight, and thank you, uh, Donald, for inviting me to give this talk. I'm very excited to be here and to introduce myself uh, to um, to everyone here, um, especially since I, as Donald mentioned, I'm adjuncting here uh, this semester. So, um, as Donald also mentioned. Um, we uh, met in Venice um, at the Egyptian Pavilion where I was uh, presenting some projects to uh, different projects and I had also worked on the catalog uh, for the Egyptian Pavilion. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about one of the projects. Um, so um, I, even though my practice, as Donald mentioned, is interdisciplinary and I, I've worked on a variety of projects from very sort of classical residential, architecture projects, competitions, uh, tonight's talk is going to focus on three projects only um, because I wanted to take the lens of public space and the projects that I've done in and on uh, public space in Cairo. And I wanted to talk a little bit about the context, anyways, of public space um, overall in Cairo. So uh, I founded my practice studio meme towards the end of 2010 in the, very, uh, in the then very complicated context of Cairo. And I say the context of Cairo at that moment was complicated for very different reasons, political and economic, as some of you may be aware, uh, following the news coming from there and even cultural. There's a very different kind of culture and education about the role of architects and artists than what I, I was taught having studied in North America. So um, the regulations on practice, for example, are very different. So you can graduate from the Faculty of Engineering and you're immediately kind of licensed as an architect to sign off drawings. But then even signing off drawings is something that is not necessary in a city where um, more than 50% of the architecture is self-built. Um, so this is just one of the many contradictions present in Egypt today that affect the built environment. Others include that as economic opportunities seem to be shrinking with new record unemployment rates in tandem, there's a huge growth of skilled um, youth, youthful labor. So there's lots of um, architects and engineers graduate, graduating every year, but they have no opportunities to practice in the sort of classical sense. And in parallel, there's also a very creative, unskilled labor that has a strong do-it-yourself kind of tradition. So my practice, in a way, tried to um, or attempted to respond to the constraints and the opportunities um, in Cairo, um, and, and you will see that in the projects. Um, and from the moment the studio was initiated, I was very interested um, in creating projects that are research-driven and with social implications, um, and therefore centered around public space. Of course, um, it's not; it wasn't always possible to just do the, that kind of project because um, they don't kind of monetize so uh, so well. So I had to balance it with other more commercial work. So in my work and scholarship, I've approached architecture more as an instrument rather than a goal, a way of thinking, observing, analyzing, asking questions, uh, while marking new potential territories on which to act. Um, I therefore have a very liberal approach of working in and on the city with varying outputs, from making a book to publishing both journalistic and academic articles, to making furniture um, and product design, art installations as photography, as well as the classical um, architectural built uh, projects. I also use Studio Meme as a very flexible platform to enable multiple collab collaborations. Um, since it was founded on the eve of, of the revolution and a lot of things were changing in Egypt, both economically and politically, a lot of partners I would work with would end up uh, immigrating, um, <laughs> um, whether it was for political or economic reasons. And so, but this actually kind of gave me an opportunity to work with a very wide spectrum of partners, um, of artists, architects, writers, curators, um, so in the end of 2010, early 2011, which was more or less the time I founded the studio, there was also a feeling of frustration in Cairo. For me, the city was um, a source of frustration because its governing logic was clearly not making it a better place for people. In fact, two nights before the January 2011 revolution, I published an article in a news local newspaper on the failure to provide solutions for public transport and the focus instead by the government, uh, by this organization called Urban Harmony, 
uh, on competitions that encourage strategies to facelift and privatize existing public squares in the downtown area of Cairo in an attempt to discourage the plebeian public that frequented those spaces. In Egypt, um, there is a perception of what is considered an appropriate public, and it draws on a constructed image of what Cairo ought to be. So advertisements, for example, on the new developments um, uh, have particular references um, to luxury and, and, and living in gated communities and malls. Um, and even regarding the downtown, um, this is the, the, um, the director of the Organization for National Harmony, and in this quote she's saying, uh, the downtown Cairo um, was one of the you know, most beautiful ones in the world, and we've lost our position. And there's a sort of sense of nostalgia and um, a desire to go back to this kind of oriental, orient, or orient, self-orientalizing kind of, uh, and, and going back to this colonial, exclusive, and elitist past. Um, and so my article somehow began to tackle these frustrations in writing, and then later on my projects um, also attempted to address that. So Cairo is a very segregated city. The predominant color of it is both from the sky and on the ground is a dusty kind of shade of brown. It seems to sprawl endlessly across smiles as you're flying in and seeing it from above um, on a formal agricultural and desert land and is made up of densely laid out sand, uh, sandy tinted buildings with very few green or public spaces between them. Green is a color of exclusivity. From above or even on the ground, the only green is along the banks of the river and on the rich island of Gazira or the late, leafy late 19th century suburb of Ma'adi, the newer desertments and, uh, developments in the desert with their golf courses. So here you can see like the segregation. Um, probably on the left-hand side, I've always sort of kept the more informal tight fabric with no green and on the right-hand side, um, you can see um, these sort of more privileged neighborhoods that have um, the privileged color of green and, and, and public space. Um, so uh, this overwhelming tan tone um, is perplexing, as historian Nasser Rabat points in his essay on the history of green spaces in Cairo, for a city lying at the apex of the bountiful Nile, one of the mightiest rivers in the world and the greening agent of its, new, uh, its own valley. Egyptians do not have the right to public space in law or in practice, whether green public spaces or other kinds of public spaces. Popular public spaces in Cairo, besides the handful of parks, like we can count them probably on five, one hand, from the 19th century that serve a population of over 20 million people, are the narrow median strip of Aruba Street on the way to the airport or the bridges over the Nile, where city dwellers improvise a public space uh, to relax and enjoy the river. In a city built around the banks of the Nile, there's actually very little space to enjoy the Nile. For more than 6,000 years, uh, the banks of the Nile belonged to people, but now 32 kilometers out of the uh, Corniche is occupied, of the 46 kilometer Corniche, is occupied by private investment. Otherwise, there are kind of pop Pub, what are called public parks, but they're not really public because they're gated and they demand tickets for entry. The Kyrian Nile waterfront demonstrates the state's conception of the public realm, uh, facilitating the progressive encroachment on the remaining public spaces of the city. There are several reasons for Cairo's lack of public space. First is security, since the Mubarak regime was determined to maintain power and order through the control of public spaces. Temporary security barriers were common throughout the city, but the more permanent green and gold metal barriers were an explicit attempt to control where people could move. So you can see these kind of barriers um, in many places of the city. And later on, even after the revolution, there were walls that were constructed to concrete and cement walls to block people. Um, there are several, uh, secondly, there's also a lack of transparency and accountability, um, which allows the government to favor private developers in matters of land use in the city. Abandoned public space is typically an indicator of a functioning democracy where decision making is participatory. Um, for example, we have this wonderful uh, park, um, the Esbekea Gardens, um, and it was in, right in the center of downtown Cairo, and yet it was paved over and fenced without any public discussion. 
uh, military clubs and syndicates monopolize the Nile Riverfront in their fenced private clubs. Um, informal housing developments have also diminished public space because of the government's inability to create a functioning and robust real estate market that can satisfy the demands of the low and middle income population. And thirdly, government officials have taken away historic public spaces from citizens for the benefit of tourism. This is the case of downtown Cairo, which is currently undergoing a serious faith lift so tourists can come to enjoy it and also uh, to gentrify it. Protecting historical sites is important, but historical buildings should also be part of communities around them and utilized in sustainable ways. There are exceptions, of course, uh, like the project to um, revamp Al Muaz Street um, in Al Azhar, which people visit on holidays and celebrations, or the development of the Azhar Park by the Aga Khan Foundation on the site of a garbage dump, uh, although it's also not fully public, it's a ticketed uh, park. Um, but still, it so somehow functions as a, as a green lung of sorts in the center of the city. So the other day I was telling uh, my colleague Christy I was going to talk about public space and the sidewalks of Cairo, and she mentioned that she had brought up my book Sidewalk Salon to her husband who had been to Cairo, and he responded with curiosity, like, how is she writing about sidewalks in Cairo if there are no sidewalks in Cairo? Um, and I guess it's a very valid and revealing sort of question. Um, I'm going to show you a couple of slides here, to, and, and you'll see that really there are uh, kind of in the typical condition no sidewalks, and that's why a lot of people walk in this in the street, in the middle of the street. Uh, a habit I think I'm going to have to uh, change very quickly in Toronto, because um, I and and here again in another sort of neighborhood, uh, you see that. Um, so um, so one of the poets commissioned. Um, to write for Sidewalk Salon had published um, an article entitled And We Dream of Nothing More Than Just a Sidewalk where she laments her daily commute, the harassment, the physical difficulties of finding a place to walk as a pedestrian. How even when there are sidewalks, the obstacles can include soda drink refrigerators spilling out of kiosks or markets or chairs. Um, and you can see here how people sort of appropriate um, the sidewalk in different ways. So it's sort of like an obstacle course um, with no kind of end in sight uh, when you're walking in the streets of Cairo. Um, even when there is paving, um, it's always a sort of private effort uh, and it's like a patchwork of different people uh, putting the tiling themselves in front of their storefront or uh, to make it more inviting. Um, so like everything else in Cairo, there are two ways of doing things, a formal avenue and the more informal way. This applies to all scales of life, from marriage, to crossing the road, to occupying the sidewalk, building your own house, and everything in the contested realm of public space, of course. So there is like a constant uh, game of cat and mouse. The more formal structures are rigid, bureaucratic, and often cater to a particular class. They also kind of willingly um, turn a blind eye for more informal solutions that people come up with to work around the scarcity of solutions. So as an architect or artist deciphering and unlocking the ever-changing multi-layered use of the street, the sidewalk, and what remains as public space um, in the city, understanding the spontaneous interventions, the unwritten rules and regulations, the social restrictions, but also intervening um, in these spaces is something that really fascinated and continues to fascinate me. Uh, my study and work in and on the public space of Cairo intended to shed a light on how interventions by different actors in the space and the objects which they generate draw boundaries, thick and thin, permanent and erasable in the city. In so doing, I focused on mapping the fields emanating from these objects and attempted to question the ambivalent and polysemic meanings that these objects communicate. Through walking, observing, and recording, my work intended to highlight acts of appropriation that occur daily on the streets and the contested territories that these actions and their objects reveal. Beyond reading and reflecting on the micropolitics of objects on the street, my work has also been stimulated by these objects. And I'm not going to talk at length about that, but for example, uh, as you see this one uh, particular object, which is a palm fiber uh, kind of crate, which uh, inspired a series of products that I created um, out of palm fiber um, in a product uh, line called Off the Grid. 
um, and it attempted to sort of reuse the scree in, in, in different ways. Um, and also use this material, which is from uh, the sort of uh, frond of the palm tree. Um, and it's a material um, that's renewable because it's, it's a part of a palm tree that has to be removed for a pruning process and was traditionally used um, to make furniture, but no longer so. And so the idea of the product line was to work with the artisans and create um, a sort of um, new interpretation of this material. And this was one of my earlier projects in 2010. Um, but tonight, I'm going to talk to you um, about um, some, like I said, uh, tentative design interventions and performances in the public space. Uh, in addition to these artifacts, which due to their ephemeral nature acted less as definitive and final solutions, but more as plausible scenario and spaces for potential um, action. So I'd like to talk to you first about one of my uh, more performance-based interventions, uh, the Wonder Box uh, project, which was a contemporary revival of the culturally extinct uh, Egyptian traveling um, theater box um, tradition. So it was commissioned by uh, an NGO, a local NGO, called Mahatot for Contemporary Art. And it was a collaboration uh, between myself and eight artists of different backgrounds, uh, performance artists, thespians, writers, musicians, um, and, um, and artists. And together we worked on the uh, design and construction of two, oh, uh, sorry design and construction of two boxes that traveled um, around the city in a month-long series of performances. Um, not sure why it's kind of stuck and funny with the slide. One second. Um, OK. So um, the traditional wonder box often took the form of a very simple wooden box with magnifying glasses and a set of prints inside often rolled onto something and they would sort of unravel um, as the storyteller was telling stories and people would look inside these kind of uh, peepholes and see the moving images inside. Um, and the Wonder Box predated cinema um, and it was um, originally uh, designed by Italian architect Leon Battista Alberti in the 15th uh, century. Um, and it traveled from Italy to Egypt, and once in Egypt was modified uh, to suit the context. Um, so, um, so in the beginning, we sort of worked as a team uh, through different brainstorming sessions, but we didn't each work in our area of expertise. We all worked together on the storytelling on, um, and developed all of the ideas together because they were meant to be kind of uh, linked and interrelated. Um, so the storytellers, uh, Leila al and Ahmed Mustafa, collected stories from taxi and microbus drivers because they circulate around the city and are a repository of stories. Um, and these stories were then merged and augmented through fictional devices. Um, and then uh, the storytellers worked in close collaboration with the musicians in our team who composed the musical backdrop. And meanwhile, myself and a uh, fellow architect uh, Mohammed Hassan uh, kind of worked on the design of the boxes uh, with the structural constraints of the set designers and the artists and the interactive designers that were working on uh, what was going to be happening inside the boxes. So we decided early on, and I'm going to show you a, a video uh, a little bit later um, in the presentation that will show the inside of the box because it was uh, sort of difficult to photograph. But we decided early on that one box would integrate traditional techniques. So it would have uh, cutouts, it would have a big stage, and layers of cutouts, and, and those cutouts would have uh, projection mapping as a technique to animate um, the cutouts. And they were, uh, both of the boxes were designed for a private immersive experience of four uh, people that would be selected from the audience. Uh, to look through the holes um, and we would perform like five different stories at each site um, and select different audience members to view inside. But this meant that the exterior of the box had to have a very kind of impactful um, appearance. Um, and so uh, for the design of the first box, I was inspired by um, a visit to um, Mashhad in Iran. 
um, where the mirrored Islamic patterns seem to have like a very kind of psychedelic, transcendental impact on those who are immersed in their interiors. Um, I found those patterns repeated in egg, uh, nuts, and seed shops um, in Cairo. Um, and seeing that mirrors were also used as uh, inside the traditional boxes for the praxinoscope, um, um, it seemed kind of appropriate uh, to use mirrors on the exterior somehow. Um, and we also wanted to have um, a sphere um, because of its purity and the desire to connect visually to magic crystal um, and disco balls. We wanted Cairo to have its own giant kind of disco ball that would travel accompanied by two storytellers um, and fantastic animated uh, illustrations inside. Um, the end result looked futuristic, like a giant spaceship uh, that had landed in different neighborhoods. So the sphere was built uh, as two geodesic domes, as you see in this drawing, um, that fit perfectly onto each other. Um, and it was further broken into these uh, smaller sort of triangles that would be connected um, because the idea was that um, the boxes had to be assembled and disassembled easily um, in case there was a problem when we were performing in the public space, but also to allow for ease of storage um, in the Mahatat office. Um, and then in the middle of the box, you have the stage, as I mentioned, with the different layers of cutouts. Um, and the electronics all had to sort of be battery operated, again, because there was no possibility to connect to outlets, of course, um, in the street. Um, and this was a prototype that we did early on. Um, and then this is the final construction. We are on a very tight budget, so it didn't allow for a lot of uh, prototyping. But this is one of the joints that was used to connect the different triangles, and you can see it um, clear, more clearly, um, the inside of the box in this image, maybe. And then for the second box, uh, we were inspired by the typical sort of ice cream cart in Egypt, and we wanted it to look very traditional from the outside, but have very uh, kind of newer techniques from the inside. So there was an uh, infrared ring that can move things around. Um, there was a hologram, a bubble machine. Um, and, and, but we wanted it to sort of disarm the viewer by looking very much like a typical ice cream cart. And then when they approach, uh, they realize that it was actually something different and, and had these really uh, kind of uh, cool animations. And again, it was different, smaller parts that would be connected and disconnected easily. And it was made out of this like folded uh, and laser cut uh, metal pieces. Um, and here you can see how um, it was all connected together. Um, and inside um, was a laptop, a glass panel for the hologram, uh, mirrored glass, and, and there was two layers of peeps and holes for people to put their hands in because, as I said, um, they could use uh, infrared uh, rings to move the images around. And here you see the sort of the bubbles um, in action um, because they would blow out at one point um, while one of the stories was talking about a mermaid. Um, so, um, skipping through the pictures uh, again, I'm not sure why. Um, but uh, basically, um, the project was very challenging because it was a very short time uh, frame. It was like a four month project to design, collect the stories, build uh, with a very, very tight budget and timeline. And of course, collaborating with nine different people with very different ideas uh, was very difficult and challenging. But at the same time, I think for me, uh, this was one of the most kind of impactful uh, projects, um, just seeing how people interacted with it on the street. And um, I'm going to show you a very short clip so you can get a taste of the kind of impact it had um, because we, we performed in very uh, different neighborhoods but mostly sort of underprivileged neighborhoods that didn't have a public space. Um, but the, the box and the surrounding audience that would gather, um, people would watch from their balconies, it sort of became a theater um, around, uh, around uh, the box. So, um, so I'm just gonna skip through. Get the flute, 
Sorry, it's in Arabic, but I just wanted you to see the atmosphere and the inside of the box because it'll show. وجه الجمعة والفلوس ما جاتش وعبدو بدير اتصل بجد وهو متنرف بص بقى يا روح امك انت لو ما كنتش جبت الفلوس دلوقتي انا هعمل لك محضر من سرقه التاكس جت سمع كلمه سلام يا ناس اشهر عليا دي بعد ما ده انا لسه جايب لك ده انا ليه عندك 10 جرام في الفلوس ده ده اللي هتقولي قال وعاد يقطع في دوم الناس اتخضت so yeah, so I guess you uh, kind of see the sort of gathering uh, that were around the box um, and, and got to see a little bit of the inside uh, of it. So I'm going to move on a completely sort of different scale and medium to um, my interests in understanding the power of representation and using it as a tool to challenge and bring to uh, the four critical issues on the city, which uh, led me to launch during a workshop I recently conducted from, with students from the German University in Cairo, a project entitled uh, Mapping Cairo. So the workshop was an attempt to analyze and understand the evolution of the city through visualization exercises. Participants worked with local architects, GIS experts, graphic designers, and geographers to create original maps based on data on Cairo. As part of the workshop, I organized a series of public lectures by leading urbanists in Cairo. The topics the students studied uh, ranged from economic activity, public space, transportation, land use, housing, and population. So participants were encouraged to think of creative ways to visualize and document their data sets correlating between different phenomena, and therefore hinting at core problems and potential target areas that can be tackled in future plans for the city. In this way, the work the students pr produce can be considered as many political provocations and calls to action and foundations in which other proposals can be built. In our attempt, we attempted to visualize the shifts and contrasts in the city and highlight the diversity of fabrics and patterns of the growth over time, revealing at times the inequalities and differences between the different districts. So for example, uh, this is the Darb al-Ahmar, which is the more uh, co kind of Islamic center core of the city. Um, and as you can see, it has a sort of the medieval kind of meandering uh, paths. And this student uh, had three layers, um, and the base layer is showing the kind of ground condition and then the, the pattern. Uh, like the urban pattern um, and then the actual extrusion of uh, one kilometer radius of um, each neighborhood. This is Aizbet al Hagana, which is um, an informal neighborhood uh, built on desert land, which is very different than Mbeba, which is an informal neighborhood built on agricultural land. And you can see the difference um, in that Mbeba has this very kind of gridded uh, pattern that followed the canals uh, of the agricultural land. Um, and the kind of uh, older fabric uh, that was paved over uh, of the fields, um, whereas El Hagena, which was built on desert land, has a very organic kind of pattern of growth. Um, um, and then Nasr City, uh, which was a 1950s uh, planned neighborhood, uh, versus downtown, which has these sort of radial uh, kind of arteries and Hausmanian kind of influence in its planning. Uh, and Nasr City, which was built on a desert, has these kind of uh, super uh, large blocks um, and parks. And so uh, the student was attempting to, to sort of visualize uh, through uh, these diagrams, uh, the differences in the development. 
Um, but she also uh, continued the comparisons by comparing uh, the size of apartments in these different neighborhoods, uh, the percentages of public space, the number of people housed um, in different neighbor in, in different typical kind of apartment uh, configurations. So, uh, you know, in New Cairo City, you have a 440 uh, square meter um, with th a family of three. Um, and in Mbebe, you have a 50 uh, square meter apartment with a larger kind of family. So she was uh, trying to show that. Um, and then um, we also uh, wanted to, uh, other than to understanding the formal and historical justifications for the differences and patterns of development, our mapping sought to show using GIS tools the discrepancies amongst neighborhoods in broader socioeconomic terms, including uh, you know, school enrollment by percentage uh, based on neighborhood um, and population under the poverty uh, line. Um, other things were the illiteracy rates um, in percentages because uh, we, in Egypt we still, we're still sort of struggling uh, with illiteracy, um, even in Cairo, um, and employment rates um, in percentage uh, per uh, neighborhood. Um, we also compared uh, Cairo to other cities. So we compared things like population, density, but also uh, the number of green space uh, per capita. Um, and the cities we compared it to were Tokyo because uh, actually this work was initially shown in an exhibition that was uh, coming from to Tokyo um, entitled Struggling Cities. Um, and it was showing Tokyo post-World War II how uh, they were struggling with um, growth but also reconstruct reconstructing the city. Um, and so this mapping was uh, to be shown in tandem to the mapping that was coming from Tokyo. Um, and so that's why we compared Tokyo, but we also compared Cairo to Mexico City and Delhi. Um, and yet Cairo stood out uh, as a place with, with the least sort of uh, uh, green space per capita. Uh, the number of newborns per minute, for example, um, Cairo also stood out in this, uh, uh, with a very high rate of growth. Uh, lit literacy, GDP per capita, average income, um, and even the price of a typical sort of uh, McDonald's meal. Um, and then we compared uh, the road systems um, and the green spaces in a different kind of uh, drawing, uh, so you can visualize it. Uh, water surfaces, uh, metro lines, um, and even kind of uh, different percentages of transport, like how many, what is the percentage of people who use the bus, microbus, walking, bicycle, rail, um, in, in those four cities. Um, so in addition to comparing Cairo to other cities and then comparing Cairo within itself with its different uh, neighborhood fa fabrics, we moved to the realm of public space in the city. Here we attempted to highlight the scarcity of planned open uh, public space um, in Cairo. And we also wanted to show uh, that there's a lot of other open spaces, but they are uh, selective um, and exclusive and, and not open to the public. Uh, for example, the golf courses um, in the new developments in the desert. Um, but then the student uh, went further and sort of compared uh, two different neighborhoods, uh, Nostra City, uh, which I mentioned before is, is a more planned uh, neighborhood of the 1950s, and the adjacent Izbet uh, al Haggana, which is an informal neighborhood, um, and the government uh, officially, the number uh, that they say uh, of, of, of the population there is 50,000 people, when in fact there's a million people uh, living in this neighborhood. Um, and they were actually the construction workers that built Nasser City and then that are now working on building the eastern uh, developments. Um, and Hagena is very different in terms of its fabric. Uh, there is a lot of uh, kind of tighter streets um, and people who sit outdoors and socialize um, in, in the sort of streets uh, and the public space, as I'll show later um, in my slides. Um, and Nostra City has these super blocks um, and, and not a lot of people circulating in, in the streets um, and these parks that are um, underutilized. And so this student wanted to highlight um, the differences in, oh, okay, oh. 
um, the number of people, so he kind of went and calculated uh, the number of people that would occupy um, a street in Haganah versus the number of people that would occupy a park in Nasr City in an attempt to understand does, you know, what, what kind of public space is appropriate anyway for Cairo because we tend to, you know, sometimes adopt Western understandings of a green park or uh, is, is a sort of uh, appropriate solution for a public space, but perhaps... Um, there was something that was stopping people from, from using it. People like density um, and movement and markets. And so that, that was maybe why uh, this was sort of uh, underutilized, um, even though it was a public park. Um, and then the, stu the student continued uh, to map um, public services across those four different uh, neighborhood fabrics. And, and this was really interesting um, and revealing. Um, because it showed um, the priorities of the planners and the non-planned responses to these priorities. So for example, um, downtown Cairo, which was very planned, had like eight mosques, three hospitals, and one police station. Um, and they were all taken as a one kilometer radius um, around uh, the intersection of the two main streets in each of the neighborhoods. Um, and then Aizbet al Haggana, the informal uh, district that I mentioned, had 17 mosques, which must have been, you know, self-built uh, by the people, but zero hospitals and zero uh, police stations. Um, and then um, uh, Nasr City had uh, 42 mosques, uh, one hospital and one police station, um, and it's planned, uh, versus New Cairo which is also planned, um, but because it's kind of a sparser, uh, segregated, like um, not, not a mixed-use kind of neighborhood. It's a residential, uh, purely sort of uh, segregated neighborhood. It has zero mosques, zero hospitals, and zero uh, police stations. Um, and so as I mentioned, this work was um, exhibited in Cairo um, at the Gazir Art Center along with the exhibition coming from Tokyo. Um, and some of it was also selected um, to be shown um, as part of the Venice, uh, the Egyptian pavilion um, in Venice. Um, and I had another project showing there, which I am not uh, showing today, but it was uh, redesigning a passageway um, in downtown Cairo. Um, and I also worked on editing the, the catalog for the, um, for the exhibition in Venice. Okay, um, and we also kind of produced uh, a mini publication, which uh, I can show uh, later, that has all of the sort of information um, of, of the mapping uh, that we did collectively. Um, so, um, finally, I'd like to end the talk with the third project, which I worked on, again, with a completely different output than the Wonder Box and Mapping Cairo. This time, uh, one of the outputs was a book entitled Sidewalk Salon, 1001 Street Chairs of Cairo, a book I co-authored co with David Puig, um, and which was co-published by a publishing house in Cairo, Kotopren, and a publishing house in Holland, Onomatope, in 2015. I'm going to be having, uh, along with my co-author, a small book launch event at uh, Art Metropole um, on Saturday the 1st from 4 to 6 p.m. So uh, copies of the book um, will be available in the bookstore as of the 1st, so I hope to see you there then. Um, so the project started right about the end of 2010, early 2011, um, and it was an attempt to focus on the micropolitics of informal design in urban public spaces. Um, the project took the lens of an over, often overlooked and apparently banal object as a way to draw attention to creative practices of design that occurred every day on the sidewalks of the city and which give Cairo its very kind of distinctive character. Our work used the prism of street chairs to reflect on Cairo and examine socioeconomic, gender, design, and political dynamics and the relationship between these issues and the use of public space in the city. The project culminated in a book, um, an interactive website, and two small videos, or three, actually, um, and one of which I will show at the end of this talk. So, in our opinion, uh, David and I, Cairo is the biggest open-air chair museum of the world. To wander the streets of Cairo is to embark on a long, linear excursion through the history of furniture, one where you might find a monoblock chair in the vicinity of a rococo seat or a bent with tonnet chair flirting with a tubular um, 
uh, Bauhaus style seat, a museum for the history still in the making, where anonymous designers write new chapters in the street corners, mixing times and styles to produce genre defying chairs in limited or unique editions. By choice or necessity, um, Kyrians work and socialize in large numbers on the sidewalk and the streets of the city. So here I'm showing uh, a series, one of the series in the book, which is the chair in a chair uh, kind of series, which shows um, how people merge two chairs in one to reinforce them. So uh, as I mentioned, by choice or necessity, Kyrians work and socialize in large numbers on the sidewalk and the streets of the city. To understand the origin and the persistence of the practices of sitting and gathering in public spaces, socioeconomic, cultural, and urban factors have to be taken into consideration. From an economic perspective, the incapacity of Cairo to provide enough jobs in the formal sector explains why for so many people work consists of an outdoor activity. The occupations of these sidewalk dwellers range from doormen and guards to shopkeepers whose shops spill out onto the pavement. With the demographic explosion and the massive rural-urban exodus, the containing dams of Cairo gave up in the second half of the 20th century, releasing floods of people onto the streets of the city. Year after year, large battalions of young Egyptians joined the informal sector to open up their own shops or workshops or spend long, idle, poorly paid hours on the pavement. In a context marked by informal uh, sort of economic activities and lack of formal public spaces, the occupation of the sidewalks with chairs can be seen as a kind of guerrilla strategy by street vendors and small entrepreneurs. Like a game of cat and mouse, this can either be tolerated or curbed by authorities. Sidewalks can also offer a uh, respite from the heat of clammy apartments. In informal settlements and in older urban quarters, poor and middle class Kyrians meet in front of their buildings as if the sidewalks were the national extensions of apartments, replacing non-existent balconies and verandas, becoming wider and more comfortable versions of small and congested salons. The gender codes of the city play an important role in shaping the patterns of so socialization in the public space and impact public behavior. Although women circulate all over the city on their own, by foot, by car, or by public transport, their absence on the sidewalk reveals the way in which gender and spatial dynamics intersect. Broadly speaking, Cairo is like a Russian doll whose inner and domestic layers are more female than its male outer and more visible skins. Despite the increase of mixed gender cafes in the upper middle class and rich enclaves of the city, the vast majorities of Cairo continue to be masculine territories. Considered a heretic drink originally, this, in the 16th century, coffee progressively became accepted as the drink of the tavern without wine, where men could entertain away from home. From small hole in the walls um, in the Islamic city to expansive affairs in the, in the faded splendor of downtown, the contemporary coffee houses of Cairo come in all shapes and sizes, usually offering indoor and outdoor seating. When the flow of client requires it, seats, the cafes expand and push beyond the boundaries of their territorial waters. Seen from above, these chairs on the sidewalk are an archipelago of moving islands where new atolls appear and disappear throughout the night. Um, so here you can see uh, these kind of configurations and spillovers. Um, wide avenues, commercial and industrial uh, districts also remain male dominated. In spaces characterized by loose social fabric and the constant flow of unrelated people, almost all professional activities linked to the pavement are reserved for men. Workers from dark, narrow workshops are regularly drawn to the sidewalk where empty chairs lie, expecting them for the pauses that punctuate their days. Some shopkeepers spend more time by their storefront than behind their counter. Sitting by the door, they appear in an amphibious position at the threshold between the outside and the inside, action and inaction, work and leisure. Navigating in those areas under the constant fire of the male gaze, women are exposed to eyes that mark their bodies with burning lasers of desire. The anonymity of the crowd plays against women. It empowers men with a freedom that encourages them too often to cross the red line of sexual harassment. In more intimate regions of the city, particularly in popular neighborhoods with a strong sense of community, women socialize on the sidewalk with less restriction. This is the case on the edge of Cairo, where urban villages are the hybrid results of the expansion of the city into agricultural land. 
In places like Omechnen and the south southern border of the city, the textures of the afternoon are clearly feminine. While some women finish or continue their household chores in broad daylight, cleaning utensils or chopped vegetables for the dinner, or chop, uh, chopping vegetables for dinner, others gather with their babies for long conversations. Like in the countryside, permanent and collective structures for sitting are by far more common than individual chairs. Cement benches, like the one pictured here, run parallel to the front walls of buildings and can host many more people than a regular sofa. The stairways that lead to the slightly elevated entrances of houses are kind of miniature amphitheaters, overlooking the unpaved roads where men pass by on their way back from the fields before a sunset. Chairs punctuate every few meters the Baroque text of the sidewalks of Cairo. In the grammar of the city, they, they operate in ambiguous ways, acting on occasions like words that convey more than one meaning at the same time. At first sight, empty chairs seem always inviting. They bring to mind a person with open arms, a temporary shelter, a comma to breathe in the middle of an accentuating sentence. This is particularly true for chairs next to kiosks, where clients sit and chat while they sip a soda before continuing their journeys. But other chairs are closer to full stops than commas. At the entrance of a building, a lonely chair can be a warning, an urban scarecrow positioned as an imaginary surveillance camera. Personifying the baweb or the doorman, it reminds any eventual intruders that someone might be watching them. An even clearer example of territorial delineation through chairs is given by those used to mark and reserve parking spaces. Stripped of their original function and usually completely dilapidated, they become improvised barriers, easy to move around when cars reclaim or leave their spots by the curb. Some chairs have been in the same spot on the sidewalk for so long that their legs have become like nails hammered into the pavement. From these chairs fixed like cinema hall seats, one can enjoy the movie of the city, an uninterrupted realist firm, film with bits of action, set religious pauses, and occasional sensual moments stirred by young women, offering a more intimate view than windows which place the observer outside the stage. Street chairs allow the viewer to be an actor, to monitor the surroundings while being immersed in them. Street chair dwellers are the front row audience of the urban reality show of Cairo. Their positions in cafes and sidewalks make them the pr privileged observers of the intimate movements of the city and repositories of endless stories. From their watchtowers, they are empowered by the knowledge they absorb. This position of leverage can be related to the message of the verse of the second surah of the Quran, which was titled the surah of the chair, um, where God surveys heaven and earth from this throne or chair above. And so surveillance from the throne leads to knowledge, and knowledge yields power. Um, and this is kind of the dynamic that these chairs uh, tend to set up. Um, so the ubiquitous, almost stifling number of eyes of the Korean sidewalk resonates with ideas developed in Jane Jacobs' Death and Life of Great American Cities. But while Jacobs insisted on the notions of do-it-yourself surveillance and built-in eyes to enhance city safety, in the authoritarian political context of Cairo, this informal network of eyes lends itself to the possibilities of over-surveillance. Street dwellers can be forced to provide reports for oppressive institutions, while they themselves are permanently under scrutiny. So oftentimes the doormen are recruited as, as sort of spies by the government. Um, and it's a well-known fact. So in the 19th century, Muhammad Ali, the Ottoman uh, governor of Egypt, was already capitalizing on the information easily available through coffee houses. Um, and quote, one wishing to hear the latest news, or more likely the freshest rumors, needed only to station himself in the coffee house for a short period of time, wrote Edward Lane in 1836. This form of espionage has prevailed until today. Secret service agents are likely to be found, along with local real realtors, in their outdoor offices of sidewalk coffee houses. If the chairs of coffee houses can somehow be considered the furniture of a wider despotic uh, machine, they've also accompanied the spread of dissident voices. Café Riche, as for a long part of the 20th century, was a hotbed of political activism. On its premises, nationalist revolutionaries operated a printing press in the 1920s that produced pamphlets against the British occupation. 
It was also from its seats that the free officers planned the 1952 coup d'etat that overthrew the monarchy. More recently, during the 2011 uprising, the energy of a revolt whose epicenter was located in downtown Cairo electrified hundreds of cafes of this area, spreading waves of heated political debates from one chair to the other. And actually, in our book, we have uh, interviews, and, and one of the interviews is um, with this tailor or a fashion designer who uh, rented out chairs to people in, in the square during uh, the revolution. Um, so he would leave his job and, and sort of try to monetize uh, and capitalize on, on the situation and, and do that on the side. Um, so since January 2011, chairs have also been directly involved in the battlefields of Cairo and have been used as weapons in the front lines of Tahrir Square, while the sides of the conflict shifted repeatedly from revolutionaries against the regime to the brotherhood against the army, and the material conditions of the battle remained constant. Next to rocks and stones from the pavement, because people would unpave uh, the, the, the actual pavement if there was a pavement to be found um, and they would use it um, as a weapon but easily available chairs also became a part of this arsenal of the street fights of Cairo. Um, on the de defensive front they also played uh, a role as improvised helmets. Um, in the continuous struggle um, over public space that has unfolded in Cairo in the past five years, sit-ins have been as much a matter of tense as chairs. Um, at the same time that the heart of Tahrir became a camping ground for political activists, cafes mushroomed on the square, uh, delineating the borders of the occupied territory. Catering to protesters and curious passerbys, tables and chairs gave a sense of structure to gatherings under permanent fear of being dismantled. To clean Tahrir and Rabah al Adawiyah sit-ins was thus to uproot along with the camping material the forests of chairs planted in the tarmac. It is also interesting to note the highly in this polit highly politicized context that chairs became extremely versatile icons used by actors from across the political spectrum to convey different messages. Um, as, as you can see here, for example, um, this is a protester carrying a throne or a chair because the word kursi has uh, the connotation of seat of power with the poster of his preferred uh, presidential candidate. Um, but also uh, other messages amongst them was a, a group that uh, defying uh, material and symbolic relationships and structured hierarchy. Um, they printed st stickers and painted graffiti stencils of chairs around the city in, the ca in a campaign that called for the military to hand over power to the parliament. And so here uh, it had a sort of image of a chair and it said uh, the people. Uh, on the backrest, and it said, uh, revolution of the people, power back to the people. Um, um, it implied that the ruler is a delegate, a representative of the citizens, and not a disconnected entity floating above the nations. Uh, the promises of stability and economic recovery have been the core pillars of the current presidency of uh, Abdel Fattah al-Sisi. The manifestations of this vision in terms of urban planning have been significant. In 2015, the government announced the creation of a new administrative and financial capital in the desert. The plan unveiled for this mega project to be built between the actual site of Cairo and the Red Sea revealed a generic copy-pasted city, a version of the suburbs developed in the last decade in the outskirts of Cairo, augmented with government offices, skyscrapers, and expanded infrastructures. In other words, a grid of wide avenues and gigantic blocks made for cars, a new rational environment to break away from the congested and uh, chaotic existing city. In parallel, the authorities have also centered their attention to downtown Cairo and worked hard to deactivate the association of Tahrir Square and its surroundings with the political events that they hosted. So, for example, uh, there was um, uh, the street of Muhammad Mahmoud, which was uh, had a lot of graffiti that commemorated um, uh, people who died during the revolution. And of course, uh, it was constantly painted over. Um, um, so by ironing out facades and sidewalks, by implementing strict laws to curb protests and increase uh, police presence, the government has reasserted uh, its presence and sent a message of rebirth coupled with order. Um, there has also been a facelift of old decaying buildings to cover the wrinkles with fresh layers of paint. 
Street vendors and cafes have forcefully been removed from central streets and alleys and pushed to the edges. Raiding of cultural spaces and arrests um, in cafes have been frequent. Um, so you, you would see this image a lot of, of, of the chairs kind of being packed up and actually we were doing a stop motion uh, kind of animation for one of the films and we were collecting uh, different chairs uh, from different owners and so we had a, a, a small pickup truck with the chairs in the back of it and every time we would pass by a cafe people would be really afraid because they thought we were like uh, working with the government to pack up um, their cafe. Um, so, um, so anyways, um, the, this kind of modernist or, or modernization of downtown and, uh, and of Cairo overall, uh, can, one cannot deny that it, you know, these types of projects find a positive echo in the aspiration of a large number of Kyrians who recognize themselves in the modernities they embody. But what is more interesting to our purpose here is to read what these initiatives reveal about the current regime. What image of itself it aims to portray through the old and new centers of Cairo. In the vision of a pacified urban environment, order plays a central role while modernity is presented as a break with a degraded and unruly condition of a city. Stains, street vendors, and critical ideas fall under a same broad category. They are considered elements that need to be hidden and silenced, obstacles in the path of progress. In this ideal urban setting, the street chairs of Cairo, broken, beaten, and omnipresent, seem equally out of place. They summarize in one object all that should be kept under the radar. In visual terms, they are dirt spots, cracks, garbage in the landscape of the city. Um, they're also, they also reveal the importance of the informal sector and are markers of poverty. In that economic sense, they point towards an unequal structure and failed attempts to fix it. They finally bring to the fore an image of idleness, of time spent together over cups of tea and coffee, and act as a reminder of the combination of frustration and conversation that can help to ignite and spread the fire of social explosions. Um, so what I read to you now is, is an abridged sort of version of David and I's longer essay in the book. The shorter version, which I just read, uh, was recently published um, in the magazine The Phenomenalist in its um, issue number six, which dealt with object uh, politics. Um, so, um, so Sidewalk Salon introduces the reader to a carefully selected assortment of the street chairs curated from our archives. The images are organized into two sections, walks and thematic series. The walks give a glimpse into our method of urban empiricism and our excursions on foot through the city. So we would basically uh, print out these sort of very basic Google Maps um, and take our Polaroid camera and, and, and uh, head out on the weekend and, um, and, and do these walks. And then we would uh, number uh, the corresponding images uh, to these analog kind of printed uh, maps. Um, to pin them later onto um, an online sort of map of Cairo with all of the chairs that we found. Um, and we would conduct interviews with the different uh, chair owners. Um, and so the book includes maps, uh, three maps to be precise, um, to show the kind of uh, our, our movement through the city and how we collected the images. Um, and we also wanted to show uh, different uh, neighborhood fabrics. So we picked Shobra Shobra al which is a more traditional center, um, and New Cairo, um, and, and another uh, neighborhood. And we uh, wanted to show that the city is sort of patchwork of contrasting parts uh, bound together um, uh, through the maps. Um, and so, for example, this is Shubra, which has a very different kind of fabric, and, and even the kinds of chairs that you find, this is the backside of that map, um, are, are very different to the chairs that you say, find in, say, uh, New Cairo, which has this uh, sort of uh, very, like I said, uh, different fabric, and the chairs tend to be uh, more plastic, uh, security guard uh, booth uh, sort of chairs. Um, going through our images, we also began to notice families of chairs. Um, and the thematic series of the books um, is organized around these families, which reveal common formal elements in the structure of the chairs and shed a light on the multiple ways um, they are used, utilized on the sidewalk. So, for example, this uh, is, is a series that was showing uh, the different kind of prostheses. Uh, for amputated chairs. So we had amputees uh, that have missing legs or have back problems. Um, and, this, and then the different solutions that are made to uh, reinforce them. 
or uh, we also had a series that sort of uh, shows a very typical uh, kind of method of cushioning the chairs using cardboard, um, layers of cardboard. Um, and here you can see some images from that series, or different kinds of cushioning uh, and layers of, of uh, what we call clothing, or, or this has a more religious kind of attire. Or other functional kind of uses, so uh, sabils or water fountains were very common in, in medieval Cairo, and this is the kind of uh, contemporary uh, solution to that, of offering water to passerbys for free using these like uh, plastic uh, water. Uh, coolers, um, or chairs that act as tables. So we try to show different functional uh, uses as well as formal relationships um, that bound the different chairs um, together. So though the bulk of the material uh, we collected uh, is visual, we also conducted several interviews, as I mentioned, with the street chair users. From fruit sellers to poets sitting in Tahrir Square, each revealed their own perspective of the city in flux. For the security guard of the Russian Airlines office, the most moving memory from his archive of observations, because some of these people would spend uh, multiple hours and years in the same spot, is a woman who feeds the street cats uh, of, of the city every day. Her care for other living creatures speaks of his feeling of connection to everything living, extending to the very dust of the city. For others, spending time with women on the sidewalk is a source of shame that must be concealed. For the younger crowd, women passing by are merely a source of entertainment to be called at from their sidewalk stoops. For Muhammad and Dar es Salaam, spending time on the sidewalk was how he got to first lay eyes on his wife. Um, Another kind of element of writing other than the essay and interviews are commissioned uh, pieces of uh, fiction and poem inspired by street chairs, uh, which we invited different young writers in Cairo to write. So writing about a um, passageway uh, in downtown Cairo, Yasser Abdel Latif retraces the atmosphere of one of the arteries of the city that brings the scale of the typical alleyways of Cairo to the wide avenues of downtown. Um, Tahir al-Sharawi's elderly company preferred uh, brings to life a bus stop seat located in front of the popular Hurriya bar. Um, and Muhammad al-Fakharani reveals how informal vendors create makeshift seats with found objects in order to allow increased uh, mobility and flexibility. Um, Amira Hanafi had uh, this dictionary of the revolution which had uh, different terms that emerged and sort of faded out of the revolution including words related to chairs. Um, so for example, chair of course, and but also couch party, uh, which was the party of, of people who watched the revolution from the comfort of their uh, living uh, room. So, um, so while this project sort of allowed us to pursue some of our personal interests, uh, walking, mapping, collecting, and to grasp the dimensions of the endless city since we did over 50 walks in different neighborhoods. We also hope to shed a light on the unique point of view held from Cairo streets and sidewalks. The perspectives of the guards, doormen, street sellers, and cafe goers who spend a significant part of their day in this intermediate layer of the city located between roads and buildings, since we can't call it a sidewalk, um, acted as a thermometer held, um, albeit accidentally, against the capital of a country facing a definitive turning point in its history. Um, in an exhibition presented in Eindhoven during Dutch Design Week, co-curated by my co-author David Puig, we presented an installation consisting of a table and four recycled sidewalk chairs. Um, and the next two slides actually show the sort of uh, web interface that we're developing where you can listen to uh, more interviews and, and videos. But this is a, an image from the um, installation in Eindhoven, which was this sort of box uh, with uh, some street chairs that can be packed up and uh, that were um, um, kind of like a camping unit table. Uh, that made it easy to travel as an exhibition. On the table, there were screens that presented videos with stories from the sidewalk of Cairo and our interactive map uh, platform with visual sound and written material related to street chairs collected during our four-year research to produce sidewalks along. The book itself, too, was present on the table. This way, the work effectively, um, a documentary became a conversation piece. So um, I will close the lecture now, and I will leave you with one of those video uh, pieces, and um, I will take questions after. And this one has subtitles. So, but the sound, I'm not sure if there's a way to increase the volume. Of course.
الافكار المختلفه ما بين العناصر اللي ماشيه هو الكرسي بيبقى عادي جدا جدا بنجيب شويه خشب او بنعمل اربع مرتين ومن فوق بتتعمل الاعلى نرجع كلكم من ادم وادم من تراب كل البشريه اللي بتلف حواليكي هي شخص واحد الشارع بس بس في حاجات بتظهر قدامك في الشارع بتضحك عليها مثلا حد بيتخانق مع بعض واحد راجع بظهره فواحد اللي وراه بيشاور له عشان يرجعه داس عليه على قد ما بتزعل قد ما بتضحك برضه ان البلد حزين عايزين البلد تمشي اه هو الموقف عايزين الناس تاكل عيش وده ياكل عيش وده ياكل عيش اركب في الكرسي ما بينزلش بالساعه اركب على الكرسي ما بينزلش كرسي زي ايه يا كرسي ممكن يكون زي الكراسي بتاعت الملك بتاعت زمان. ده مطول ومربع ومدقق وشو حاجه شيك تقعد على كرسي تتجاس على ورا مش زي تاكل اكل في غده من تحت. في ناس كتير عندها طموحات في كرسي موس يعني فاحنا الحمد لله لينا طموحات في الكرسي بتاعنا. يعني ايه كل ما واحد يجي يرمي حاجه بتاعته او بيبيع حاجه يعني نقول لهم لا احنا ناخد الكرسي ده ممكن ست اشهر سنه بيستهلك ونروح نرميه وندور على واحد تاني غيره ما تلاقيش حته تانيه هنقعد عليها. عند البواب اللي هنا قعد حوالي 12 سنه يعني ممكن. والله انا بفضل الكويس يقعد على الكرسي مش اي حد يقعد على الكرسي. لا هو كراسين احنا الوحشه وكراسين هم عشان ده بتاع الغلابه اكيد طبعا ببطن طبعا وفي الكرسي مش مش بشكل الكرسي برمز الكرسي مش اكتر من كده. ما انا لما الغلاف كسر فقلنا عشان نلم الدار بتاعه دهوت عملناه في نفس الوضع يعني عادة الكرسي احسن من عادة الارض. هي كلها قاعده يعني لما امسك من هنا شويه اقعد هنا شويه عادي. بالنسبه للسياسه بقى انا مش هتكلم في السياسه. لما بسمع كلمه كرسي اول حاجه بفكر فيها ان انا اقعد. I'm not sure why the sound was not uh, very loud, but that's it. Thank you.